book, The Distraction Addiction, looks at why it is that we've developed these dysfunctional relationships with our information technologies and how we can or to improve those so that we can be both more mindful about our relationships with technologies, but also be more mindful while using them. Because one of the most important effects that they have on us is that they have a great ability to fracture our attention or to put us into what Linda Stone calls a state of continuous partial attention, where we're kind of focusing on things, we're kind of distracted, and it's not really actually all that healthy. So what I wanted to do in the book is explain how we can practice contemplative computing, how we can use these devices in ways that help us be more focused rather than be more distracted. I think that schools generally, and NAIS maybe in particular, NAIS and its membership in particular, have a really great opportunity now to help students deal with digital distraction. Um, I think that you know, for a long time we've thought about technology in the classroom mainly as a or of an issue of accessibility. You know, making sure that students know how to use devices, um, that they acquire you know, computer literacy or technical literacy. And I think we've won that battle. Right? There are plenty of schools that have iPad programs or or of, you know, one computer per student programs. And so accessibility really isn't the problem any longer. In fact, all, in some places it's almost too much accessibility that we're, we're now having to deal with. And so I think that the great challenge that independent schools in particular have is the opportunity to help students learn how to use these technologies more thoughtfully, to understand how they affect their focus, to help them see how they can be critical and analytical about their own relationships with technologies and with devices in much the same way that they are critical and analytical about you know, art or literature or you know, pieces of music. One of the really great things that schools can do is to work with everybody, with teachers, with students, and with parents to help them realize that it's not necessary to work this way all the time. That there are great things that you can do in the classroom and outside the classroom with information technologies. But doing great things doesn't mean doing them every minute of the day. I think when you're thinking about sort of the fact that students have grown up with these technologies, you know, that they come into schools coming from a rather different kind of world than you know, my generation did. It, it's worth recognizing that they are starting from a different place, but it's also important to realize a couple other things. For one thing, uh, the smartphone, which is absolutely ubiquitous now. You, know, you feel naked leaving the house without, you know, without it, is about seven years old. Um, and in that short period of time, in other words, the age of the average, I suppose, second grader, the smartphone has gone from being an absolute novelty to being completely commonplace. And I point that out because it's very easy to forget that there was a time really not that long ago when that sort of constant connectivity that we carry around with us was very much the exception rather than the norm. And that's important to recognize because it then helps us see that, yes, this connectivity is here, but we still have plenty of choices about or of how we're going to go about using it, about what sort of effect it's going to have on our lives. The fact that you can be connected does not automatically mean that you must be connected. I think for students, maybe the single most important thing you can do is help them recognize that they have choices that their relationship, their, their social media lives, um, the way that they use these technologies is absolutely not carved in stone or you know, carved on their smartphones, but rather is something that they can make choices about. In my book, The Distraction Addiction, I interviewed a number of technology executives and academics and other people who both read you know, 
lots of books and printed journals, but also read lots of things online where they have, you know, they're big fans of or Kindle or other kinds of ebooks. And I talked to them about how they make the choice between one versus the other. And it turned out these people who are voracious, intensive readers who work an awful lot were amazingly thoughtful and amazingly consistent about what they read where. You know, for things that you have to read really, really closely, really intensively, they all went for paper because just the physical affordances of paper, the fact that you can mark it up, you can write in the margins, um, makes it possible to engage with the ideas they felt more deeply than or reading something you know, online. However, when you've got a thousand pages of something that you really just need to get a kind of, you know, a sense of, or you need to digest a whole bunch of articles but not read them really intensively, you don't print them out. You, know, you load them on your device and you read them that way. And so different technologies, different media get used for different strategies. And I think it's absolutely not too early to teach that to kids in high school or even in middle school. If there was one thing that I would want people to take away from the presentation or to take away from the book, it's that they have a choice about how they use these technologies and that that choice matters immensely. You know, we often think of information technologies as sort of alienating or dehumanizing, you know, turning us into sort of you know, cyborgs. And I think that bad technologies can do that. Mindlessly used technologies can make us less human. But one of the incredible things that humans are able to do is learn to use devices, to use technologies so well that they become extensions of ourselves, that they allow us to uh, express ourselves in ways we never could otherwise, that extend our minds, our memories, our physical abilities. You know, humans have never lived in a world without technology. We began evolving into Homo sapiens really a couple million years ago with the first invention of hand axes, stone tools. And, we've, and no generation since then has lived in a world in which they have not made things and used them and been changed by them. And so uh, today's information technologies, when they don't work, it's not because we're stupid or because we're not trying hard enough, it's because they're badly designed, or it's because they've been crafted into weapons of mass distraction whose purpose is to commoditize and resell our attention. That's the bad news. The good news is we can fix that. And individually, we can learn how to use these in ways that enhance our minds and enhance our memories, to do all the things that information technologies of the past, be they you know, stone tools or you know, the printing press or pen and paper, notebooks, all those things, all those great things that they did for us in the past, we can learn to do with today's devices, while also minimizing the downsides of you know, or perpetual distraction. There's a great Buddhist saying that pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. You know, there are bad things that happen in the world, and we can't control that, but what we can control is how powerfully they affect us. And I think likewise, that in today's high-tech world, that connection is inevitable, but distraction is a choice. And recognizing that we have that choice, that we can make a choice, and by doing so, we can make better versions of ourselves, is you know, the one thing that I would want people who read the book or hear the talk to remember.